The Secret is Out. OS updates for Apple are here. Hi, welcome in to episode 199 of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray, thanking you, as I do, for joining us today. Apple surprised just about everybody on Tuesday, the 15th of September, when it said that updates for most of its operating systems would be out on Wednesday, the 16th of September. I mean, these were actually finished, done updates for iOS, iPadOS, watchOS, and tvOS. And while the secret is out, the updates are still working to keep your secrets safe. Focusing on the biggest of the updates today, we'll look at privacy features in iOS 14 with Nick Leone on this edition of The Checklist, brought to you by SecureMac. Privacy is Apple's middle name. It is Apple Privacy Incorporated. That is, of course, not true. But the company has staked a lot of its reputation on privacy, especially over the last few years. Now, just yesterday, Apple released updates to most of its operating systems, uh, the biggest of those being iOS 14. Nick Leone writes for Secure Mac. He's been looking into some of the privacy protections added to iOS, and he joins us to tell us more. Nick, thank you very much for being here. Hey, Ken. Good to talk to you again. In, uh, in looking over the piece that you wrote for Secure Mac, you can kind of divide it up into two categories. Well, uh, dividing stuff up is what I do for things like this. So I looked at it as stuff Apple is doing and stuff Apple is letting the user do or you know, decisions that Apple's making and decisions that Apple is leaving up to the user. So I thought first we would tackle what Apple is tackling uh, practically by itself, and then later we'll hit the choices that Apple is leaving up to us. Now, because I divide everything and then divide everything again, basically turning every podcast into a bento box, I want to divide what Apple is doing again into stuff that we're going to see and stuff that's kind of happening behind the scenes. So we'll start with one of the most obvious ones. In fact, people saw this one coming months ago. A lot has been made of app activity transparency. iOS 14 shows users what's going on on their devices in ways that it hasn't before. Uh, You've written up two of the changes, clipboard access notifications and recording indicators for the mic and the camera. Now, I would imagine a lot of people remember the first one, the uh, clip access notifications or clipboard, excuse me, clipboard access notifications. Yeah, I mean, that. I know that's something you discussed on another podcast on the checklist, and it's something that really made headlines this summer. Um, what happened was a bunch of the beta testers of iOS 14, they started to notice that like TikTok and a bunch of other apps, like 50 plus other apps, seem to be accessing the system clipboards constantly. And so in iOS 14, every time an app pastes something from the clipboard, you're going to get this little banner notification at the top just letting you know that it's happened. And I think for most people, like for the most part, this isn't going to change how you use your device at all. But if an app is accessing your system clipboard you know, excessively or when it doesn't appear to have any good reason to do so, now you're going to know about it. And you know, I guess do with that information what you will. If it bothers you, maybe uninstall the app. Um, I don't know. I kind of hope after all this publicity with TikTok and others um, – Hopefully, just the, the the existence of this feature in and of itself is going to inspire what I'd say what I'd call better behavior on the part of app developers because now they're going to know they can't really hide what they're doing from users. And then the other one, uh, recording indicators for the mic and camera. I mean, once you know it's there, it's kind of hard to believe that we haven't had this the whole time. Yeah, I know, right? Um, so, so now in iOS 14, whenever an app is using your mic or your camera you're going to see a little recording indicator in the status bar. It's just, it's like a tiny green dot or a tiny orange dot. And the green dot means the app's using the camera. The orange dot means it's using the mic. And, you know, again, not something that's really going to impact the way you use your phone, but it's kind of a nice reassurance for the more privacy-minded or maybe even, I don't know, like myself, the more paranoid among us, because now we can feel confident that, you know, apps aren't secretly recording us in the background. So Apple's also made some changes with the way that we interact with apps, again, with privacy in mind. Three functions that you've looked into here are App Store privacy information, upgrade to sign in with Apple, 
and then app clips. Now, what can you tell us about the App Store privacy information? Right. St- starting later this year, um, the App Store is going to require developers to offer kind of a brief summary, a self-reported summary of their app's privacy practices, uh, including data that they're collecting on users, um, especially data that could be like linked to you, your accounts, your devices, and you know, as well as other information about data collected for tracking purposes. And so, I mean, Apple has compared these self-reported privacy summaries to like nutrition facts on food packaging. And the idea is to give users a choice, right? To help people make better, uh, more informed choices about what they're putting on their devices. And I mean, in that sense, it really is kind of like nutrition information, right? You read the label, you know what's in it. If you choose, you can still choose to eat junk food if you want. Um, and with this, you know, if you if you want to install the app privacy equivalent of junk food on your iPhone, you can. But, you know, at least now you know what you're signing up for. And this isn't available now. iOS 14 is available now, but this feature is going to come. They, they say they haven't been specific about one, but they say sometime later this year. So sometime before the end of this year, we should see this. See, what's interesting, as much as I want to divide this stuff up, I mean, you're right. That is, yes, that is a thing that Apple is doing, but users do have a choice at that point uh, with what they do with that information. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, same with this next one. This is kind of a decision for users. Um, although kind of Apple acting on its own, um, upgrade to sign in with Apple. Yeah, yeah, this is good. Um, for those who don't know, who don't use the feature, or who maybe just don't remember, um, sign in with Apple is a feature that lets you create uh, a new account for like a website or an app using just your Apple ID. And then you use your you use the sign in with Apple feature as a login method, right? So the the reason that it was seen as a real privacy win is you don't have to share any additional personal information with app developers or with websites, right? And it even has a feature where, like, if you want, you can hide your actual email address from them. So there's a, I think the feature is actually just called hide my email. And if you select it, um, Apple will create a unique random email address for you. And that's where you'll get any, you know, offers or notifications or communications or whatever from the app. So they don't have your email address, but they can still reach you. Um, so yeah, like all of that, awesome from a privacy perspective, uh, and why it was seen as such a big deal at last year's WWDC. So in iOS 14, developers are now going to have a way to offer an upgrade to sign in with Apple for their existing users, for existing accounts. So users can switch over to this more privacy-focused login without actually having to create a new account. It doesn't look like something that developers are going to be required to offer, but I'm, I don't know, for me, it's kind of nice to know that like, if I have apps that have more privacy-conscious developers, that they'll be able to offer me this you know, one-click upgrade if they want. Now, when you say they're not going to be required to offer it, I just want to be clear, if a developer uses a third-party sign-in option, like, you know, uh, Facebook or Google or whatever, they do have to offer sign-in with Apple as an option. But what you're saying is they're not going to have to offer the upgrade to sign-in with Apple. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, like, if you're a developer, um, if you want to offer sign-in with Facebook, as you say, sign-in with Google, whatever, yeah, you do have to offer sign-in with Apple, too. And that's, you know, kind of black and white. It's in the developer documentation. Um, As for upgrade to sign in with Apple, I think this is more about Apple providing developers with the back end code that they would need in order to switch over an account from an existing login method to sign in with Apple and then offer their users that kind of like one click option to upgrade. And then the last thing we were going to hit for this segment, um, app clips. Now, what's funny is I was thinking about this one as, you know, a convenience Hadn't really thought about it as a privacy protection. I guess the first thing, can you remind people, uh, you know, what app clips are? App clips are basically just like a small part of a full app. And they're meant to be used sort of uh, in the moment when you're out and about. And it, it lets you do something without actually having to install a full app on your device. So you're supposed to, the idea behind an app clip is basically to give you just enough functionality to get something done. Um, so you can think about things like maybe making a reservation at a restaurant, checking out like a rental item, uh, maybe even making a quick payment, right? And so this is stuff where like before, maybe you just wanted to do one little thing, but if you wanted to use the app, you'd have to put the business's whole app on your device just to do that thing. 
right? Now you might be able to use an app clip instead. And so again, they're, they're like small pieces of a full app. So they're lightweight. They load onto a device in seconds. Um, they're temporary. They disappear after a while if you don't use them again. And so, yes, it is a convenience thing, right? There's um, multiple ways that developers can, can give you to load an app clip onto your phone. Um, there are app clip codes, which sort of look like, if you've seen the picture of them, it looks like almost like a circular QR code, if you can imagine that. Um, there's standard QR codes, NFC tags, iMessage links, um, place cards on maps, you know, a lot, a lot of different ways to get an app clip on your phone, right? Um, but from a privacy perspective, I think the real benefit of app clips is that you get app functionality you need without installing the app and without giving app developers, you know, permissions and access to your data and without giving them like an indefinite presence on your device. Um, and in addition, like, Developers, if they want, they can app, integrate app clips with sign in with Apple or with Apple Pay. So, for example, if they want to be able to accept the payment without asking for credit card information, um, they can do that. And so, again, there's a potential to use these things to offer functionality in a way that, you know, really safeguards user privacy. And I don't know, I, like to me, I think this is going to be awesome for people who, say, travel a lot or who are always, you know, they're, they're always out trying out new venues, new services. You know, they use their phones a lot. And so they're always being asked, you know, hey, install this app, install this app. And the thing is, you know, the, the kind of tough thing is maybe you do want that functionality. You want that convenience. You want that discount, whatever, uh, that all those op- apps are offering. But at the same time, like, you don't necessarily want to put a million different apps on your device. You don't want to be sharing your data with tons of developers who you don't really know. And so app clips are nice because they reduce your exposure to all of those third parties, but at the same time, they they allow you to take advantage of the useful aspects of the apps. And um, something I didn't mention in the article, but this is, this is true as well, developers will be able to add an option to an app clip that um, will upgrade the user if they want to the full app. So you can you know download the full app onto your phone. So if you try an app clip and, and you like it and you say, hey, this is neat, this is something that seems to work really well. It's really convenient. I'd love to have the full app on my phone. Um, you can do that. And so it kind of o- offers something to the developers as well, because it's almost like a test drive for their app, um, which I could see as benefiting them as well, as well as the user. Moving now to stuff that'll probably be a bit less obvious to the end user. Uh, here we have private Wi-Fi addresses and some changes coming to Safari. Uh, start, if you would, please, with the uh, private Wi-Fi addresses. When you connect to a Wi-Fi network, your device has to identify itself to that network. And it does this using something called a, a MAC address. And um, that's that's not like MAC the computer. It's capital M-A-C. It's just media access control. And all, it, all a MAC address is, it's like a device-specific ID number that lets the network know, hey, this device just joined the network. Um, Problem is, from a privacy perspective, if if your iPhone's using the same MAC address to join every single Wi-Fi network, then potentially, anyway, somebody monitoring networks, somebody with access to network logs, could start to track your activity or even your location. And so to prevent this, iOS 14 is going to create different unique MAC addresses for every Wi-Fi network your device joins, which um, it should make it a lot harder for somebody to be able to figure out that all of those different MAC addresses are actually the same device. And so, you know, in theory, a lot harder to use network activity to track you. Um, now, the thing is, it's it's enabled by default in iOS 14. So for most of us, I think... You don't need to do anything. It's like it's already there. It's on. It's protecting you. Um, but you do need to know where the controls are because there are going to be maybe some, pro- probably relatively rare, but some cases where a private address might actually cause some kind of problem with the network. Uh, like a network might not address, uh, might not accept a private address or might not grant you full internet access or something. Or I think Apple even said some aspects of parental controls might not work on some networks if you have these uh, private address is turned on. Hmm. And so so you need to disable it. But, but the thing is, you need to disable it just for that one network. So you can do it network by network, 
which is again is kind of nice. If you're having a problem with one Wi-Fi network, you don't have to shut the feature off globally. You just shut it off for that one network and solve the problem. So to to see the controls, you would go to settings, uh, Wi-Fi, and then you'll see this list of Wi-Fi networks. And next to each network, there's a little information button. It's like a, a you know a little eye in a circle. You tap on that. And you'll see info for the network that you want to inspect. And you'll see a little toggle switch that says private address. And so, again, this is by default turned on. But if you're having a problem with that network and you think, you know, the private MAC address is is the problem, just toggle the switch to off and see if that solves the problem. Now, as far as the Safari enhancements, um, this one gets a little bit squishy, I guess, for you know, one of the changes. Uh, the website privacy report is something uh, that users are hopefully going to see. So, you know, maybe if I ever, if we redo this episode, I'll move it to another one. But for now, <laughs> uh, we'll leave it in the one that Apple's doing. Uh, but uh, this is one that might actually come to people's attention. Yeah, I think so. I mean, a- I mean, Apple's already implemented this thing they call intelligent tracking prevention. That's stopping websites from tracking users around the Internet, stopping a lot of the, the cross-site tracking. And what Privacy Report is, is basically just a closer look at this, right? Um, if you want to see it, it's pretty straightforward on an iOS device. You know, if you're in that Safari um, browser, you go up to that double A icon in the address bar and just tap it. And then you'll see a button for Privacy Report. And if you click on Privacy Report, you get, I think it's a, a 30-day report of uh, you know, which sites are using trackers, how many trackers they're using. Uh, you see info about the trackers themselves, right? Which which trackers are most common across all the sites that you're visiting. And, you know, again, there's not necessarily anything to do. This is stuff Safari is already blocked, but it's more about just getting insight into what different websites are doing when you visit them. I kind of wonder if there's a little bit of shaming there as well. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I mean, if everybody starts looking at this and says, hey, why local newspaper website are you tracking me i'm going to you to keep up with stuff why are you trying to keep up with me i mean maybe there's a little bit of uh there's a little bit of calling attention to it to uh to put some shame in their game <laughs> possibly okay and the last one we want to hit on this list is safari password monitoring uh less privacy than security though i mean if your password's weak your privacy's out the window anyway absolutely um so on iOS 14, Safari is going to offer a password monitoring tool to help you see if you're using a password that's unsafe. So if you stored passwords using Keychain, Safari is going to, from time to time, check them against the database of passwords that have shown up in known breaches to see if your password's been compromised. And I, I, mean, I should say right here, it doesn't mean Apple is reading your actual passwords. They're not. They're using cryptographic techniques to create um uh, a value that's derived from your passwords, and they're checking that against what's appeared in data breaches. And if they find a match, they'll know that there's, you know, your password has appeared in a data breach, and they'll warn you. And they'll also warn you if you're using um, a weak password. So, you know, if you're using uh, password one two three four as your password or something, it'll tell you, mm, you probably shouldn't use that. So, if you want to see whether or not Safari has discovered any potential issues, uh, you go to settings to passwords, and to security recommendations. And you'll see there'll be a little icon. I think it looks like a little triangle with an exclamation point in it. See a little icon if there's some issue. You tap on that, and it'll tell you what's going on. You know, And if, if they tell you, hey, your password is weak, you should change it, then you should change it. If they tell you, um, especially if they tell you, hey, your password uh, may have appeared in a data breach, it would be a good idea to change it, then um, you know, listen to that recommendation and take action on it and you can help keep yourself safe. Privacy controls that Apple is giving you in a moment. But first, a word about MacScan 3 from Secure Mac. Chances are you're doing more with your computer today than you were a few months ago. Thanks to all the working from home and learning from home and social distancing not saying you're doing anything risky with your computer. I will say if you're running your computer without a good antivirus suite, well, that's risky right there. You need a good anti-malware solution like MacScan 3. 
MacScan 3 is a great defense against malicious software attacks aimed at your Mac. It's developed by Secure Mac. Trusted names in computer security and developers of exceptional security software for the Mac for over 20 years. MacScan 3 detects and removes Mac malware, catches keyloggers, removes tracking cookies, and provides full range or targeted scanning, all without crowding up your hard drive or slowing down your machine. Sign up for a free 30-day trial today. That's securemac.com slash MacScan. Then when you decide to buy, buy for less. You can take a little off your subscription to MacScan 3 with offer code CHECKLIST. Try it first. Watch it kick those tracking cookies to the curb. Then when you're ready to buy, buy for less with offer code CHECKLIST at securemac.com slash MacScan. Nick Leone is with us today. Uh, Before we get into the choices that Apple has left to the user, there's something that's been bugging me for a bit, and it ties to bigger issues around Apple these days. A lot of lawmakers, a lot of companies competing with Apple on some level, say Apple is taking choice away from the consumer. Now, when I said earlier there's stuff that Apple is doing, then choices Apple is leaving to the user, the user always has a choice in that the user is choosing to use Apple. I mean, I can think of extreme cases where the user has no choice, you know. Um, Maybe it's your work phone or something like that. Those are really limited circumstances, though. And I know we can't get too far down this road without wandering into law and anti-competitive behavior and things like that. It's just this thing that's been bothering me for a bit, the idea that I, as the consumer, could not possibly have considered all of these things before I made my choice, or I couldn't, you know, understand what I was doing, that I didn't have a part in this. I, I keep choosing to use Apple. Um, I, it's just weird to me the way, the way it's sort of like, well, you, you didn't realize here, let me take care of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, like, so, you know, Okay, Apple's a big company. They're going to get criticism. And you hear some of the criticism of Apple. And, it, you know, in some cases, I can kind of see the point, um, especially when it's things like app developers talking about, you know, app store policies or the revenue cut that Apple takes or changes to the platform or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you don't agree with it, you can kind of see where they're coming from, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the kind of stuff you're talking about, right? And, um, I think we'll probably get into this a little more in a minute. But like, if you're talking about user privacy issues, I, I personally I tend to question the motivations of the people who are, you know, quote unquote, just raising concerns about consumer choice, right? And the the one thing I always kind of come back to is Apple's not a privacy watchdog. They're not a nonprofit. They're not EFF or something, right? Um, they're a trillion, like now a two trillion dollar company. They're a business, uh, a very, very big, very successful business. And generally speaking, they're not going to do things that are going to lose the money. Uh, there's a reason that they've made privacy, you know, their brand, so to speak. Um, and, and I think what that means is like any company, they're letting user demand drive their decision making. So when some other company, you know, some, some critic says, oh, you're taking away user choice. I don't know, man. To, to me, that doesn't really pass. Uh, the sniff test, right? Because I don't think Apple would be forcing user privacy on their users if the users didn't really want it. Or, you know, if it was going to cause customers to go elsewhere to buy like Android phones or whatever. And so I, I, to me, if I think about Apple's strong focus on privacy, like, yeah, it's I'm sure it's driven in part by their culture, by, by the people who work there, by their company values. But I think in large, large part, it's driven by the fact that they're meeting a demand in the market. And like you say, it's not like users don't think about this stuff. It's not like they're completely passive and, and have no voice. Um, to me, it seems more like, more probable that like people want privacy. They say they want privacy, and Apple hears that, and they respond to that, and they give people what they're asking for, what they want. And maybe it's more a case that other companies just aren't happy about that. Yeah. Uh, so for the people who have already chosen the iOS ecosystem, Apple is leaving a few more choices out there, uh, choices that we actually didn't have before. I mean, except in the whole don't use a smartphone. That was kind of your choice. 
Uh, you've written up four sets of data sharing controls that are new in iOS 14, app tracking controls, approximate location, limited photos, library access, and finally network access. Let's start with uh, probably the biggest of those, the app tracking controls. Yeah, this one um, eventually, hopefully, will be a real game changer. So I think anybody who's listened to the checklist for a while knows that like apps track us in a lot of different ways, mostly so that our data can be used either to, to sell to someone else to serve us targeted advertising. Um, and in iOS 14, you're going to be able to say no to that kind of tracking. So starting early next year, whenever an app wants to track you, it has to display a pop-up that gives you the ability to opt out. And if you decide you don't want to even deal with that on an app-by-app -app basis, you can basically just um, tell all apps that you aren't going to be granting tracking permissions to any of them and just stop them from asking in the first place. And so the, the setting to find that, the, the setting to do that is at settings, privacy, tracking, and then there's an option that says allow apps to request to track. And there's a toggle switch. If you toggle it to off, uh, it disables apps from tracking you. It stops them from accessing your device's advertising identifier, the, the IDFA, the identifier for advertisers that they use to identify your device and do their ad tracking and serve you targeted ads. Now, I'm curious what you make of Apple's decision to push the implementation of those controls to sometime in uh, 2021, because when they talked about this at WWDC, with this just having launched yesterday, we thought this was going to be a decision that we could make or that would be effective, I guess, starting yesterday. Uh, what do you make of the push? Yeah, and, yeah, you're right. I mean, originally, that's what they'd said. That's They said they're going to roll it. Ex when when iOS rolls out, um, this feature would be there. And so now they've they've changed the timeline a little bit. So right off the bat, it's important to note like at the moment, app developers can choose to ask for permission to track, but they don't have to ask. So if an app, if an app asks you for permission to, to track and you say no, then it's not tracking you. So great, you're fine. But um, if an app doesn't ask, well, it might still be tracking you. And so in order to know whether or not that's happening, you've got to go and look at their privacy policy um, for the time being anyway, until early 2021. Um, however, if you use that allow apps to request to track setting that we just mentioned and you turn it off, um, that will block even the apps that haven't asked for permission to track from accessing um, at least your device's advertising identifier. So in, in terms of like why this is happening, what, what's behind the delay, um, it's in response to basically partner companies and advertisers saying that this was going to destroy their business. Um, and I mean, Facebook was saying, for example, that it was going to cut some forms of ad revenue in half by like 50 percent. And I mean, on the one hand, like maybe if it's a, a really big company like Facebook, it's a little harder to be that sympathetic. But then you, you do have to remember there's like lots of little developers, app developers, you know, other websites, advertisers, or maybe even little you know, social media marketing agencies or whatnot that probably do need a bit more time to shift their business model and to figure out how they're going to do this going forward, right? And plus, there's just, you know, like ordinary shareholders, investors or whatever who don't really want to see Facebook's earnings take a huge hit at the end of the year. So I guess there's that to think about as well. And I, I mean, I think Apple basically just listened to all of this feedback and decided it was the right thing to do to give people a little bit more time to get their ducks in a row. And I mean, in, in fairness, this was really, as you say, it was only announced in June. So it hasn't even been three months, which is, you know, I guess a pretty short time frame to completely rethink your business model if you're one of these advertisers. And, you know, also you got to consider these aren't like exactly normal times we're living in, right? Yeah. With all that's going on in the world. So so maybe you got these smaller or medium sized businesses where in, in 2020, they really can't implement changes like this as as fast as they would have been able to do, say, last year, right? So I don't know. It, it kind of strikes me as a, a reasonable compromise. But that said, I'm really looking forward to when they make these requests to track mandatory for apps next year because it's a very good thing for privacy, even if it's not so great for Facebook. Uh, next up, uh, approximate location. 
Right. So this allows you to share your approximate location instead of your exact location with an app. So in iOS 14, when an app asks if it can access your location data, you'll see a toggle switch option for precise location as well. If you toggle it to on, you're sharing your exact location with the app. If you toggle it to off, you're giving the app your general whereabouts, but not your precise location. And so this works on a per app basis, right, which makes sense because some apps do need your exact location. Like if you have a ride hailing app or, I don't know, like a delivery app or something, well, if you want your delivery to get to you, if you want your driver to find you, you need to give them your exact location. That's that's fair enough, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you have like a weather app, right, um, you can't give it no location because it'll default to San Francisco or something, and that doesn't do you much good if you're halfway around the world. But they probably don't need to know exactly what block you're on, right? So if you just tell them generally, I'm in this city, you get the local forecast without sharing too much information. So it's it's nice. It gives you a little more granular control about what you're sharing in terms of location. Uh, and to see this for each app, you, you go to settings, privacy, and location services, and then you'll see a list of apps and what um, what level of location permissions they have, either none or exact or uh, approximate. Now, I got to say this next one actually freaks me out, not because of what it is, but because, uh, I mean, well, we'll just go into it. The next one is limited photos library access. This one's nice. It, it gives you, again, it's more granular control. It's more about fine-tuning what you share with apps. Like before, you could give an app access to your photos library um, or not, uh, but it was kind of like an all or nothing. And iOS 14... You're going to have more control over which photos you share with apps. Uh, so if an app wants to access your photos for whatever reason, you can say yes, you can say no, or you can use an option called select photos. And then you can specify which photos or which like folders the app can access. Um, so if you want to see what you've shared with an individual app, you go to settings, privacy, and photos. And... If you've already shared, say, like a limited selection of photos with a particular app, you can also edit which photos are shared. Like you can add, you can say, hey, share more photos with this app or, hey, don't share that photo anymore with that app or whatever. Yeah, there's nothing about any of that that bothers me. The part that freaks me out is like, how many apps over the years have I used where I wanted to post one picture from, you know, Disneyland or one picture from the Grand Canyon. But while I'm posting one picture... Until now, grinding that access meant that the uh, service with which I'm posting the one picture may have actually gone ahead and snagged all my photos because, you know, well, I gave him permission. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've had that happen. I've had it happen where, like, there's, like, with the Facebook app, you know, there's, you give it access to photos so you can upload and post, like, one photo. And, uh, but then the next time you're in your uploader tool or the next time you're in some area of the, the account, you can see all of these other photos that you've taken since because it can now access all your photos. And some of it's definitely like not stuff that I would ever want on Facebook. And like I don't mean anything like scandalous or like not safe for work, but I, like, I don't want to post pictures of my little kids playing around the house um, or like a screenshot of a bank transfer maybe that I've saved to my phone, right? Um, that might be stuff that I'm happy to send to my mom or my wife or whatever, but like, I don't want it on Facebook servers. And I, I certainly don't want to accidentally share it to my story or whatever either. So I don't know. It's nice to know that you can kind of distinguish between uh, folders and photos that you don't mind an app accessing and then stuff that you just never, ever wanted to see. And then the last data sharing control that we're looking at today is uh, network access. Yeah. So apps, apps will sometimes ask for the ability to access other devices on your local network. And uh, I mean, most of the time, well, I, don't, I don't know, most of the time, many times this is for completely legitimate reasons, right? Like you might have an app on your iOS device that needs to pair with and discover some other device on the network in order to work. Um, could be, I don't know, like a digital camera that it's, you know, it's uploading photos to storage or something um, or speakers or something like that, right? The problem is if an app knows about the devices on your network. It could also use that information to profile you or to collect data on you. Um, and so in iOS 14, an app is going to have to request permission before it can access your, your network, before it can see what other devices are on that network. 
And I mean, for me, it's just rule of thumb. If, if I can't think of any good reason why an app would need that, I don't grant that permission. And if you figure out that you've made a mistake later and oh, there is a good reason that app needs to, to see the devices on my network, well, then you can you can go back into the settings and change that. So if you want to enable or disable local network access for your apps, uh, you go to settings, privacy, and local network. And there you'll see a list of installed apps with, you know, it's just on off toggle switches to let you control whether or not they can access your network. I got one last question. This is a, a debate that raged, raged between me and Augustometer back in the day. Are you an um, update automatically guy, or are you a wait and see for a couple of days guy? I'm an update automatically guy because I'm a I'm a forget to do things that I should do guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, and on this show, I'm a guy who's outnumbered. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that Nick writes for the Secure Mac site. If you go to securemac.com slash news, you can keep up with some of the stuff that he's keeping up with. You can also follow him on Twitter, Nick Leon Ruiz. That's N-I-C-K-L-E-O-N-R-U-I-Z. Nick Leon Ruiz on Twitter. And thanks again to Nick Leon for joining us today. If you're looking for more security news and how-tos, a great place to look is securemac.com slash checklist. There you'll find notes for this show, for the last show that we did, all the way back to the very first show that we did, golly, four years ago, I think. Anyway, notes for all those shows right there, and you can actually listen to every show right there as well. It all starts at one place, securemac.com slash checklist. If you have a question you would like to ask or a topic you would like to hear us hit, our email address is checklist at securemac.com. That address again is checklist at securemac.com. And if you can't remember that, please do remember this. You're listening to The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>